evening to all of you and for all the wonders of this modern communication we still have glitches and problems so uh, may i request professor devendra singh to start the day session uh, good afternoon everybody so today we are having a, a lecture on biodiversity particularly of the eastern himalayas uh, this world biodiversity though it was used for the first time in 1985 only by rosen but uh, after that it has uh, been a catchy word all over the world and uh, human beings we have been destroying our biodiversity with full force through destruction of the habitats through clearing of the forests and now we are concerned about uh, the conservation of whatever is left with us uh, most of the biodiversity of the world is restricted to generally the warm climates uh, if you take the area uh, around the equator you will find that in 10% of the area about 90% of the diversity of living organisms exists particularly uh, we talk about the amazon forests which are so rich in biodiversity and uh, human beings uh, we are clearing the amazon forests and uh, uh, while clearing that we are destroying our biodiversity so we have to be very careful about conservation of our biodiversity and uh, at the international level lot of efforts have been done uh, to conserve our biodiversity and uh, the un they declared uh, 2011 to 2020 as the decade of uh, biodiversity similarly the next decade 21 to 30 has been declared uh, a decade of ecosystem restoration so we as human beings we are concerned about uh, whatever we have done and we are trying to conserve our biodiversity uh, the problem with conservation of biodiversity is that we don't uh, even know what actually exists it has been estimated that there are uh, about 8.7 million species of uh, animals in the world but we know only about uh, say 1.2 to 1.3 million species so about 85% of animal diversity is still unknown to us and we uh, are trying to conserve whatever is known as far as trees are concerned the situation is better and uh, maybe a major chunk of the tree diversity is known to us so when we talk about uh, biodiversity generally most of the workers they will be they will be working on a particular group on a small group or even on a family or an order but uh, we have a person with us today dr trevor he will be talking about uh, uh, biodiversity in the real sense he'll be talking about uh, trees up to birds so india is one of the mega biodiverse countries we have got four biodiversity hotspots and one of the hotspots is the eastern himalayas so we have a worker who has uh, sound knowledge about biodiversity in the eastern himalayas so dr trevor price from the university of chicago he'll be talking today uh, on biodiversity of the eastern himalayas from trees to birds so over to trevor for your talk please thank you very much so all right thank you very much let me inter- let me introduce trevor first okay yeah it's my privilege to introduce trevor price a professor of ecology and evolution in the department of ecology and evolution at uh, university of chicago his main research interests are on himalayan biodiversity of birds and trees especially the evolution of color vision in birds and space speciation processes with main focus on birds as model organism his research work is phenomenal and i had the opportunity to collaborate with him 
for his remarkable contributions to science, Trevor has been honored with E.O. Wilson Award, American Society of Naturalists, and American Society of Naturalists Young Investigators Award, to cite a few. Besides, he has been elected Fellow of American Academy of Arts and Sciences. So please join me in welcoming Professor Trevor Price for today's talk. Thank you very much. Um, can I share the screen? Yeah. And can you hear me fine? Yeah, it's okay. Right. So um, I can't see anyone when I go to presenter view, but does that, I don't think that works. I'm sorry. Let me go to the proper slideshow. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's fine now, Tim. Well, thank you very much for the nice introduction and for inviting me to give this talk. Um, some of the things I was going to say have been said already, so it will be good to reiterate them as we go along. Now, um, as was already pointed out, the number of species that one sees in the world is very unevenly distributed across the world. And it's particularly tropical regions that have so many species. So here we've got the latest rendition of the number of species of amphibians, birds, and mammals totaled together in different locations of the world. And you can see there are three localities that have particularly high numbers of species. These are the uh, northern, the tropical part of South America, the tropical part of uh, Africa, and the tropical and subtropical part of Southeast Asia. And if you look at one of the obvious reasons for this, it's that warm, wet areas, i.e. tropical areas that have a lot of rain, um, create a lot of plant growth. So the bottom plot here is an estimate of net primary productivity across the world. That is the number of grams of carbon per square meter per year that are produced in uh, small areas. And you can see that there's a strong correspondence between the amount of plant growth and the number of species of vertebrates that I just showed you. So that uh, again, uh, Central and South America in the tropics, Africa in the tropics, and in particular Indonesia, have enormous amount of plant growth and they've got a lot of species. So there's a strong correlation between um, productivity, the amount of plant growth, and species richness. But the correlation itself is strong, but it breaks down when you look at mountainous regions. So what we've got on the bottom here is an assessment of the amount by which the number of species exceeds that you would predict from plant growth. So we've got little squares on the bottom there. Each one of those is about 100 by 100 kilometers. And the bright red areas are areas where you've got many more species than is expected based on the total amount of plant growth in that square. So recently, this has been labeled as Humboldt's enigma. Why are there so many species in tropical and subtropical mountains? Why is it that we have more species than we can explain based simply on plant productivity? What I'm gonna to do today is address Humboldt's enigma in the subtropical mountains of the Himalaya, and that's our little circle there. So we're looking at the Himalayan region, and uh, obviously you, everyone who's listening to this talk is well aware of the fantastic mountain range that is present in the Himalaya. It, uh, in this picture, there are all 109 peaks that are over uh, 7,000 meters in the world. 
um, and of course the three high, uh, Mount Everest and Kanchenjunga, the first and third highest mountain in the world uh, in the east and central Himalaya and the second highest mountain is uh, in Pakistan, just to the west of the Himalaya. So this uh, huge mountain range that's coming out of the subtropical region, uh, one obvious contribution to the great diversity of species is the great diversity of climate that the Himalaya uh, produces. So this is a plot that we made that takes world climb data and maps uh, on the x-axis the average temperature and on the y-axis total precipitation for half degree cells across the world which are in gray. And then we took the half degree cells across the Himalaya in blue. We truncated at uh, a mean average temperature of zero because below that there's not much life. And you can see that the Himalaya has a huge diversity of climate um, spanning, I think about, uh, I'm sorry, spanning 30% of the world's global climate diversity. So a huge amount of climate diversity present within the Himalaya. But that climate diversity, and indeed the plots that we saw before, uh, apply at the local level of, well, if you call a local level of 100 kilometer by 100 kilometers square. So what we're gonna do is gonna look at Humboldt's enigma when we focus down to one specific region that is the region Bhutan, Sikkim, and North Bengal. This particular place has um, something like 600 bird species breeding, which is uh, close to one in 15 of all bird species in the world. And the only place that we're certain that you get more bird species breeding in a similar area is in the Northern Andes, where you can get about 800 species breeding. But the East Himalaya and East African mountains have similar numbers of species, about 600 bird species, which far exceeds anywhere else. So we're, we're focusing, I want to emphasize this, that India in, in the East, in Sikkim, Sikkim and North Bengal and Arunachal Pradesh has uh, the second highest biodiversity in the world. And as has already been pointed out by Devinder Singh, uh, we know quite little about that diversity. So what we're gonna do today is summarize what we do know about that diversity and why it is we've got so many species there. So if you look at Bhutan uh, and you take the same plot as I showed you before, the Bhutan region itself covers uh, about 20% of the world's climate. So we would expect uh, this climate diversity to contribute. If you look at this plot now, you can see that very hot areas are missing from the Bhutan, whoops, very hot areas are missing from the Bhutan region and uh, cold, wet areas. Those are the gray spots to the right and the gray spots to the left above. But we have this um, wettest, warmest regions in the Himalaya are in the Bhutan region. So um, we're focusing down on this particular area and all of the research I'm talking about will be conducted in India and the black dots here are the study sites that we've worked at. So we've got four lower study sites in North Bengal, and then we've got five higher study sites in Sikkim um, to the left. Now, one of the problems that uh, I, I just put into the talk because of the uh, introduction, the nice introduction I had, of course, is trying to figure out if the biodiversity you're studying is representative of what it was before human impacts. And I put, I put this slide in because it's um, not really still appreciated 
that hunting, it's not, it's not just uh, habitat destruction, climate change, or any of the other threats. It's multiple threats together, but hunting in uh, the East Himalaya has become a pressing, urgent problem. So there are some regions of Arunachal now which are consisting of empty forests because of hunting. And uh, so you need to work in a place where hunting is not a problem. And we've been fortunate in North Bengal and in the uh, Kanchenjunga National Park in Sikkim that these are relatively pristine with respect to hunting. Of course, the other threats are present. I just wanted to mention this, that um, we do see habitat destruction and land use change. And this is just a shot from Arunachal, which is another reason why we're focusing more on the well-protected areas of West Bengal and Sikkim. So let's have a look at the altitudinal gradient in Sikkim, which we've already uh, noted uh, is experiencing a huge variation in climate. So here we are in Buxa Reserve at 150 meters, with two tropical tree species illustrated. By the time you get to a thousand meters, uh, as you go up the elevational gradient, we still see strong tropical representation with the fig on the left, but the right side there is a laurel, which is um, already indicating transition to more temperate environments. By the time we get uh, further up the mountain, we're getting to uh, oak and other um, temperate species. And this is a uh, picture of the study site in Niora Valley in West Bengal. Just to point out, it's extremely well forested and well protected. And one point I will return to is that this particular place has more songbirds than anywhere else in the world. Songbirds are a group of birds that compromise almost half of all birds, about 4,500 species. There are less songbirds in South America than there are here. This is really a phenomenal place to go. If you look, uh, if you now cross over to see Kim, you can see the rest of the gradient in Kanchenjunga National Park. So here we are again at 2000 meters, and that's the uh, mountain of Cabru in the distance. Let's go up to 3000 meters and now we're in very much temperate climate where we've got hemlock and a species of rhododendron represented. And at 4000 meters are about at the tree line where uh, a different species of rhododendron is represented. So one of the things that we should notice is that we've seen strong turnover in plant communities as you go from the base to the top. Of the more than uh, 200 species of tree that are at the base of the mountain, only five species have been recorded at 3,000 meters, and they're very rare there. So lots of turnover of species along the elevational gradient, and this is surely contributing to the huge diversity of plants and animals that we're seeing in these tropical regions. So you see this not only for trees, but you see this for birds. So here's Euhenas, Fulvetas and Minivets. And you can see that at the bottom of the mountain, you've got one species, in the middle of the mountain, another species, and higher up, yet a third species. So just like the trees, the birds are replacing each other along these elevational gradients. And here I've just, uh, drawn uh, distributions of the five species of minivet that live along that our gradient that we're studying. Now, each of these blue lines represents the altitudinal distribution of one of these five species. These altitudinal distributions are based on our own work, but as well as compilations from the literature. And what you can see, again, is elevational replacements, We've got two species that range up to about 2,000 meters and two others that range above 2,000 meters. We see this pattern again and again. I've already shown you it for Fulvetas and Euhenas. 
And here's another example for the five species of sunbird that you see in the East Himalaya. Now, what I wanna point out with this particular plot is that we've got turnover, which is contributing to um, diversity, but we've also got local diversity differences. So at the top of the mountain and the bottom of the mountain here, there's just one species of sunbird, but in the middle there are two. So that local diversity is also surely contributing to the high numbers of species that we see here. Now, given that there is turnover, so we've got one species, then another, then two, and then another, we, need, we could ask why it is or what it is that sets local diversity and ask how local diversity and turnover together are contributing to the huge diversity that we see. So that will be my goal. Now, that requires estimating what local diversity is. And one way you can do it is by the way I've shown you here, which is just to look at elevational ranges and see how often, oops, how often uh, you get two elevational ranges in the same place. But this is quite unreliable. Many of these elevational ranges uh, at the top and the bottom, there are very few individuals. They're based on just casual observations. So as a complement to this, in our work, we've done surveys of both trees and birds in five hectare grids. So here we are in North Sikkim, near the tree line, and we set up a grid here, this red square here, and we spent two days documenting the plants and the birds within these grids, getting an estimate of local abundance. This will only sample some of the species, but if it gives you the same result as the overlapping range result, you'd be more confident that we've got something close to the reality. So this shows you the results for trees. Uh, this is the number of tree species present at each location. Uh, as you go from the um, bottom to the top of the mountain, uh, if you overlap ranges, uh, I said before 200, but I actually meant 500 at the bottom um, with only five that actually get up to here. But if you overlap ranges, you can see that there's a slight peak at about 500 to 1,000 meters. And if you look at surveys in five hectare grids, you get a slight peak at 500 meters. So the match of our surveys with overlap give us confidence that this pattern that we're seeing, which is very similar in both cases, is a real measure of local diversity, which is what we're gonna be asking the question about to begin with in this study. So what I'm gonna do now for the next 30 minutes or so is ask what it is that drives local diversity? Why are there more species at the bottom of the mountain than the top? And I'm gonna introduce uh, climate as a very important control and then discuss what role competition might have. And then I'm gonna spend 10 minutes asking the question that's been much less often addressed, which is what drives turnover why do you have one species and then another and then another and then another as you go up the mountain and you see this again and again. So let's turn to local diversity and talk about climate. So what is the climate? One of the issues with the East Himalaya is trying to figure out what the climate really is. And it's only recently that there have been compilations of rain gauge data from Bhutan and the Himalaya. And these compilations suggest that the climate uh, precipitation is maximum on the front face of the Himalaya at about 500 meters. But you can see this huge variation. And so at the bottom of the mountain, you've got between 3,000 and 4,000 meter millimeters of uh, precipitation a year. Uh, corresponding to areas that are in rain shadow or not. So this is our best estimate of how precipitation varies along the gradient. This is the world climb estimate, which is fairly similar, which just interpolates between rain gauge stations. And you can see, again, we've got huge diversity in climate at the bottom, 
but above uh, at 2000 meters, it's lower than it is anywhere below that. And then it steadily declines as you go up the mountain. So we would like to translate rainfall and temperature into plant productivity. That uh, plant productivity is actually measured as the amount of plant growth. And that is not possible to do. We haven't got the data for that at present in the East Himalaya. But what we can do is calculate AET or actual evapotranspiration. This is a measure of the amount of water that's evaporated from the ground or transpired from plants. Uh, so in other words, it excludes rain that just runs off. So we get high runoff off the front of the Himalaya. And you can see that if you estimate actual evapotranspiration along the Himalaya, you have a decline from zero to a thousand meters with possible a slight peak uh, just above zero. Then uh, more or less plateauing from a thousand to 3000 and then a steep decline above 3000. So this measure is known to be a strong correlate of plant productivity, plant growth. And we're gonna use it as a surrogate for net primary productivity, which we've already shown at a global level uh, and at a hundred by hundred kilometer scale corresponds nicely with the number of plants. So let's look at the very local level and ask how local diversity correlates with plant productivity or AET. And the answer is it correlates extraordinarily well. So here we've got the AET plot on the left and uh, on the right, we've got uh, at the top there, the pattern for trees that I showed you earlier. And then all, we, all I've done on the bottom right is take the annual evapotranspiration at a point, the number of trees at a point, and plot the two. And you can see that the number of trees is extremely well predicted by plant productivity. So remember, this is the number of trees in a local place. It's not 100 by 100 kilometers square. It's the number of trees that are present in uh, one single locality. And you see this pattern again and again. Here's some recent studies. Here's one on amphibians from Eastern Nepal. Another one on ants, this time actually taken from Arunachal Pradesh. And a third one on non-passerine birds based on our own work. In all cases, you see a decline, which correlates well with actual evapotranspiration. It correlates better than it looks because the uh, elevational ranges of these studies are different along the bottom axis. So if you look at amphibians, it goes from 1,000 to 3,000 meters. And you can see the correspondence with AET is almost perfect because 1,000 to 3,000 meters, you see exactly the same shape. The ants are just recorded from 1,000 to 2,000 meters. And again, that fits very well with the steep decline in AET. Non-passerine birds are a little different, um, possibly because they're more mobile. And this particular example is based on uh, observations of elevational ranges. So you occasionally get non-passerine birds moving up the mountain. But the overall conclusion of this is that plant productivity explains species richness at the local scale, as well as at the grander scale. And this is clearly an important reason for high diversity in the Himalaya. But there is uh, an exception from this, which is the thing that I'm gonna concentrate now on for the next 10 minutes, which is songbirds. As I pointed out before, songbirds, these are the, all the species that we're familiar with. They include, in fact, crows, sunbirds, warblers, robins, 4,500 species in the world, almost half of all bird species in the world. When you look at a plot of songbird and abundance, you find there are more species of songbirds at 2,000 meters than there is at the bottom of the mountain. In other words, in an area where uh, plant productivity is much lower than it is at the bottom of the mountain, we have more species of songbird. 
And again, we confirm this pattern because we've done it both by overlapping the ranges in the top and surveying five hectogrids as shown in the bottom. So why is it that songbirds do not match the pattern that we're seeing for trees, amphibians, non-passerine birds and ants and many other groups? Well, the uh, plausible explanation is that um, at these mid elevations, we find more insects than we do lower down. And in fact, you can divide the songbirds into birds that eat insects, which are the majority, and other birds that primarily feed on nectar, seeds, and fruits. And you can see the nectar, seed, and fruit birds show again our classic decline with productivity. It's the insectivorous birds that have a peak at 2000 meters. And this is the place where we see the highest arthropod abundance. Here, what we did is we assessed arthropod abundance by putting uh, bags over branches, chloroforming the contents and counting the number of insects in the bags. It's very time consuming, but it's very reliable. And it shows us that there are about twice as many insects at 2000 meters as there is at the base of the mountain, which corresponds beautifully with about twice as many insectivorous bird species. So the obvious question is, if plant productivity is higher at the base of the mountain, why are there fewer insects there? And uh, to bring you back to one of, the, one of the possible contributions to this, and we agree, we know it's not the only contribution. But I'm going to focus on one contribution, which is the possibility that ants are competing with birds to eat other insects. So this is the plot I showed you before, where we look at the number of ant species as you go from the bottom to the 2000 meters. Now, if you look at the total number of ants that crop up in the bags that we put on the branches, you can see that there's many more ant numbers, this is not species, number of individual ants at the bottom of the mountain. And by the time you get to 2000 meters, we almost have no ants in our bags. And in fact, it's a very classic uh, pattern that 2000 meter elevations across the tropical regions of the world have extremely few ants. So we set out to ask if ants at the bottom of the mountain could be uh, competing with uh, insectivorous birds for the insects. So I love saying this word, some ants are insectivorous. So we've got an insectivorous ant. The most prominent of those is the weaver ant. Here's a weaver ant attacking beetles. And weaver ants are well known as a, a, a species that um, depletes other insects. In fact, in organic mango orchards in Australia, weaver ants are used to keep the mangoes clean by eating all the insects on them. So weaver ants are known to have severe effects on insect abundance. But we wanted to set out and test this idea and ask if they could be competing with ants using a controlled experiment. So one of the things about weaver ants is they build these nests. And so uh, that's why they get their name. They weave leaves together to make these nests. So it's possible to experimentally remove the nests by clipping them. And then uh, you can remove all the weaver ants for certain trees. Uh, so we conducted this study at 150 meter elevation in Chapramari and removed weaver ants from 15 trees and we left weaver ants on 15 other trees and we match these trees for species. So you remove the weaver ant and then you put tanglefoot around the base of the tree here to stop it coming back. And this is the work done by Supriya on the left here, who was a master's student at the Wildlife Institute of India and then did this study for her PhD at the University of Chicago. So that after one month of exclusion, this was conducted in May 2015, Supriya went back 
and collected branches and counted insects on the branches. And here's the upturned umbrella she used to collect the branches. And this is the basic result. What we've got here is the number of insects present in May uh, for the treatment where they remove the ants and then on the right for the control. And, you, and these little bars are standard errors. And then you've got the subsequent numbers in June. And you can see that on the treatment, the number of insects present one month later was about three times higher than it was in May, whereas for the control, it had not increased significantly. So removing and preventing weaver ants from coming back had enabled uh, an increase in number of insects on these trees. Clearly, weaver ants having a huge impact on other insects. In these plots, I've also separated out the Lepidoptera and the Coleoptera. So this, um, these are moths and beetles, and there'll be a reason for that. But you can see that moths and beetles together increased uh, even more by about fourfold from May to June on the treatments, whereas they actually slightly declined on the controls. So this is evidence that ants are competing with birds and maybe a reduction in insects caused by ants is one reason why we have fewer insectivorous small birds at this elevation. But to firm this up, we'd like to show what the diets of these birds are and see if the birds are eating the same food as the ants and therefore directly competing with them. So Supriya used DNA barcoding to evaluate the frequency of the five common orders of insects and spiders in bird diet and in weaver ant diet. So she's at this particular elevation, she studied 18 fecal part and feces from 18 different individual birds she caught. And you can see that nearly all of them contained moths or Lepidoptera and nearly all of them contain beetles or coleoptera. And the reason that will become clear now why I separated those two out, the ants were having particularly strong effects on lepidoptera and coleoptera in her experiment. So it's clear then that ants are reducing items of food that birds really like to eat. And um, if you look at, she also collected uh, insects from weaver ants as they came to a colony. She just sat by a colony and collected the insects that were carrying to the colony for one hour. And you can see that weaver ants indeed eat the same food as birds. Uh, about 60% of the weaver ant colonies had a, a moth, about 50% had a beetle. And then the other, um, the, the wasps, the um, cockroaches, and the true bugs were also being eaten by birds and weaver ants. The only thing that seems to be different is birds like to eat spiders and ants don't, which is the final one on the right. So to putting this together then, we have evidence that birds and ants are competing for food and that ants reduce the food available for birds. And we believe that that is one reason that's contributing to the low number of bird species at the bottom of the mountain. So we've come up with this basic solution that uh, the amount of rain and plant productivity is a strong driver of why you have so many species in one place. The exception is the songbirds. But if you add the songbirds to ants, which remember show a decline from top to the bottom, bottom in the top to the mountain, if you think that ants and songbirds are eating the same food and you put them together, you bring back this nice correlation with plant productivity. So this highlights a couple of points. One is that plant productivity is extremely important in explaining species richness. But the other one is that we've really got to start thinking about interactions between very distantly related groups. Like Himandabhati studies ants, I studied birds. Fortunately, we had a student between us who studied ants and birds together. But it's a very difficult thing to do when you have to learn a lot about two different systems. 
that's what we need to be doing if we're going to understand these diversity patterns. So this first part then of Humboldt's enigma, why are there so many species in tropical and subtropical mountains? We see strong correlates of local diversity with plant productivity and resources. And our argument is that more resources enable more species. Now I'm going to skip explanations for why that would be, but be happy to address that with people at the end of the talk or over email if they want to do it, because I want to now turn to the question of turnover along mountains. What drives beta diversity or turnover along the gradient, which is the other contributing factor to high diversity in the East Himalaya? So what drives altitudinal turnover? So this is the question that I raised uh, early on. And I must say, you know, why is it we've got essentially four species, four groups that have different elevational ranges. We've got one at the top, one, two here, one here, and one here. And again, you see this, you see this pattern of about four replacements altitudinally in group after group. It's present, I think, if the next slide is, it's present in the Minivets I showed you as well. It's present in the Uhinas and so on. It wasn't until I started to get this talk ready to give today that I realized the question has never been asked. We really don't know why it is that we have four species typically aligning along the gradient. But we might have some idea why it is that we've got a different species at the bottom than the top. The fire-tailed sunbird at the top is breeding in rhododendron. It experiences snow sometimes on its nest and has lots of uh, physical difficulties to deal with. The crimson sunbird at the bottom never sees snow. Uh, it never experiences a climate that varies very much, but it has to deal with probably all sorts of diseases like humans do, such as we have to deal with malaria, uh, it almost certainly experiences something like avian malaria to a greater extent. So the idea here is one of trade-offs. If you can invest in dealing with cold temperatures, you can put all your energy into that. You might be completely useless at dealing with malaria. If you have a good immune system to deal with malaria and put all your energy into that, you'd be completely useless at living in cold temperatures. So each species is better in the place where it is. And uh, through competition, we'll keep out another species that's more poorly adapted to it. So that is the basic assumption, exactly why we get the turnovers is still a question that remains to be seen. But what I want to do is concentrate on the biggest trade-off that we think exists in the world, which is the temperate tropical divide. So the East Himalayas at about 2000 meters uh, is a point where we see regular freezing. By regular freezing, I mean that the mean minimum temperature in January is below zero. So above, this is typically taken as a tropical temperate climate turnover. Uh, uh, when you have regular freezing, we call it temperate. And when you have less than regular freezing, it's usually classified as tropical, although in our case, of course, it's physically subtropical. So this tropical temperate divide has been considered to be extremely important in setting species turnover. And just by eyeballing it, and I only realized this today, you can see that this is indeed a turnover for these sunbirds well, we've got three sunbirds above the freezing line and two below. So how is this supposed to work? The, this has been really applied to trees. Um, and in fact, I would refer you to a paper by Paul Fine from a few years ago. who really talked about the trade-off that must occur for trees. Trees that invest in freezing are very poor competitors in places where it doesn't freeze. Ple ple trees that live in places where it never freezes, just cannot deal with freezing temperatures. So you have a, a, a very strong turnover in trees 
when you go from tropical to temperate regions. This turnover uh, has been documented in uh, America, where there's only one common species that is present both in the tropics and up in uh, Michigan. So how strong in general is this tropical temperate divide? And does it apply in the Himalaya? And does it apply to trees and birds? That's gonna be the last five or 10 minutes of this talk. So to do that, I want to introduce this idea of biotas and realms, which is a very, uh, which stems back to Wallace in uh, the middle of the 19th century where he noticed that particular regions of the world were defined by the shared species they have. So for example, Australia has marsupials like kangaroos, which are seen nowhere uh, west of um, New Guinea. Uh, the fauna of, and flora of South America is very different from the fauna and flora of Africa and so on. So the biotas, are defined as co-distributed sets of species that define realms. Realms are areas where these biotas live. So it's pretty obvious why uh, South America has a different biota or different species from, South, from Africa. There's a big water gap between them. There's been very little dispersal. They've been independently evolving for at least 80 million years. But if you look, you can see, and so this is a, one rendition that I'll, I'll tell you how we did it in a minute. And you can see that there are some biotas or some realms that just seem to end at places that are not coastlines. And one very conspicuous one is in the Himalaya. So what is, what is it about this place in the Himalaya that drives a turnover from an Indian Southeast Asian fauna and flora to a more temperate fauna and flora of, of, of uh, Asia um, as you go north. So let's just briefly introduce you to the method that we use to determine these realms and biotas. What I've got here along the x-axis are six different species. And you can think of them as birds or trees or any of your favorite thing. And on the y-axis, I've got six different grid cells. So the plot I was showing you was based on half degree by half degree grid cells. And a one indicates the species is present in the cell and a zero indicates it's not. In this particular example, the first three species are present in the first three cells and the second three species are present in the second three cells. So we have a complete match of biota, the species A, B and C to realm X, one, two, three and the other biota, species D, E, and F, to realm four, five, and six. So here we have got a complete match of biota to realm. But of course, it's not usually like that. Here, we've got a grid cell, which has some species that belong, uh, has one species that belongs primarily to the other biota, but is now present in the realm of the other biota. Okay, so the realm here of four through six is now occupied by a species that is predominantly in the other, by other realm. So this would be an indication of an integration between realms. And if you think about what we're gonna ask about is we've got a tropical realm that I showed you and a temperate realm. We'd like to know how abrupt the turnover is. A very abrupt turnover would indicate strong, uh, in, strong uh, driver of the freezing line, but a very gradual turnover where some species leak from one realm into the other would indicate less impact of the freezing line. So uh, to do this, you have to figure out, um, you have to separate out the presence of a species in a location, which is either one or zero. We, ascribe, we, we have to first of all determine the biota it belongs to. And then we have to ask how much of that biota is contributing to the grid square. So it's a fairly complicated thing. So bring in a statistician, Kushal Day, who worked out a method to do this. 
And without going into the details, I'm just going to show you the result. So the bottom left uh, map here is the map I showed you before, where uh, Kushal had set 13 different realms across the world. So you define the number of realms. If there are 13 realms, you can then look at a blowed up pit of the uh, India, and you can see how the transition is happening from the Indian realm to the north northern realm, the contributions of the different biotas at different places. So for example, this grid square has a strong tropical element, but it also has uh, an Asian element. This grid square is firmly in, tr in the tropics. This grid square is firmly in the Asian element. You can see some little bits of yellow coming in here. These are species that are coming in from China uh, east and the Oriental region. So now we've got an estimate of how the realm is turning over from a tropical realm to a temperate one, and it looks pretty abrupt. So we repeated this method for the samples that we've done in these five hectare plots. And what I show here is the freezing line, which is the green to gray transition. And you can see below the freezing line, we've got one realm or one, one bow to contributing to the grids, the tropical one, and above the freezing line, we get the temperate one. So the overall conclusion here is that the freezing line is extremely important in causing a turnover from uh, low elevation species to higher elevation species. Now birds are migratory, so we don't believe that it's a direct effect of temperature on birds, but we do believe that it's got something to do with the habitat turning over driven by trees. So that for the final slide or two, let's look at the pattern for trees. So what we did here was we said, let's take the whole Himalaya take tree, I think it's about 800 species of trees in total, and estimate uh, the num you know, what tree is in what uh, grid square. And so these are the grid squares for the whole Himalayas um, on a resolution, uh, actually, I don't recall what the resolution is. Um, and we said, let's assume there are four realms and, and, and consequently four biotas belonging to those realms and have a look at their distribution. And you see uh, that you get one realm that lies to the west of Nepal into the drier, lower regions of the West Himalaya. But you have three realms that represent turnover along the elevational gradient. And one of those turnovers is happening at about the freezing line where you have a bunch of blue, which is the realm of trees that lie above the freezing line. So we extracted the temperature for these points. These are the points occupied by species that occur essentially above the freezing line, but they're connected all the way. You get the same um, realm over in the West Himalaya as in the East Himalaya. And you can see that the freezing line is a sharp divider between the realm above the freezing line and the three realms below, we get uh, a, another, uh, another realm that lies between 2,000 and 1,000 meters in the east, another realm that goes from 1,000 meters to the base in the east, and a final realm, which is at low elevations in the west. So again, just to make the point here is we've got a strong impact of the freezing line, which is one reason that we're getting a turnover in biotas as we go from low the high elevation above the freezing line is essentially populated by a different set of trees that can deal with freezing. So let's just conclude. Why are there so many species in tropical and subtropical mountains? First of all, at the local level, there's a huge correlation of local diversity with productivity such that in high uh, in low wet areas, you get a large number of species. And that uh, is qualified by the presence of competition between different groups. If you have a lot of species at the bottom, and then you have slightly more, slightly less at the mid elevations and even less at the high elevation, you can still have a huge diversity in the Himalaya and elsewhere, 
because they're different sets of species. And we've been able to identify the freezing line as one important reason why you have different species at the top of the mountain than the bottom of the mountain. So with that, uh, I would like to just acknowledge the people who did all the work. The Wildlife Institute of India included uh, Dan and Jay Mohan, who's now the director. Suresh Rana did his PhD thesis on all the tree work I talked about. Patab Singh was my uh, big colleague studying the birds. And the Shumigosh collected the insects. In Chicago, Alex White and Kushal Day and Matthew Stevens did the statistics. And um, Supriya and Corey Moreau studied ants. And I should acknowledge, of course, Himenda Bharti's help uh, logistically. Uh, we're still waiting to try and finish up the project we started with him. So thank you very much. Uh, I should say, by the way, that's uh, Suresh in the middle there, and he's part of the field team. So with that, I will stop sharing and uh, ask Himenda what I should be doing next. Thank you for your wonderful talk. Uh, I have quite a few questions from students. Uh, one question is that generally we are seeing that uh, uh, the diversity of animals is much more in warm climates. But uh, Eastern Himalaya is not uh, falling in the, in the category of uh, a warm climate, but still it's a hot spot for biodiversity. So what's the reason for it? Well, it, it is a hot climate at the base of the mountain. So it's warm and wet at the bottom of the mountain. And that is a place where you get the biggest diversity by far. So that, that is the main contributor. But, we would, but the point of this Humboldt enigma is that it, it alone cannot explain high diversity because if you go to somewhere else in India, you'd see the same number of species as you see at the bottom of the mountain in Bhutan. So that is part of the reason. But then when you go higher up in Bhutan, you see fewer species, but they're different species. So that gives you even more species. When you go up higher still, you see fewer species still, but again, they're different species. So the sum total along the elevational gradient is higher. I would just, one, one interesting thing, and maybe uh, people, are, if you don't mind, I'll just share the screen again, because I put this slide in um, because I thought my, people might ask about this. What's extremely uh, interesting to me is uh, that uh, the only place in the world that has more species than the East Himalaya is the Andes. So why does the Andes have more species than the East Himalaya? And you can see that the reason is that at the bottom of the mountain, there are many more bird species, passerine birds. I'm sorry, I'm talking about passerine birds, which is the one we study the best, but it's also true for trees. You can see that at the bottom of the mountain for both passerine birds and for trees, you've got many more species in the Amazon than you have in, uh, in um, Bengal. And, Rather remarkably, that correlates with rainfall. So at the bottom of the mountain in uh, the Amazon, you can have 25% uh, uh, more rainfall and much higher plant productivity than you do in Bengal. So again, productivity can go towards explaining a lot about why it is that the Andes beats Bengal, but Bengal beats everywhere else in the world because of that productivity explanation as well. Okay, uh, another question from one of the students is uh, that if uh, the number of ants increases, the population level increases tremendously, is there any possibility that these songbirds, they will change their feeding habits? If, sorry, if what increases number if, of ants? Uh, if, if there is a, a good population of ants, yeah. which is uh, a food for the songbirds, so yeah. will the songbirds change their habit, feeding habits and uh, shift towards uh, eating ants only? Well, that's a good question. Uh, 
there's t quite a couple, there's a couple of parts to that question. So um, first of all, if you think about niches, let's supposing there's just two kinds of beetle in the world and you could have two birds, one that would be able to eat the big beetle and one that could eat the small beetle. So those would be the two niches that are occupied. Now, if ants come along and eat the small beetle, if they can reduce the small beetle to such a low level that the birds can't find enough to survive, you would just end up with one bird there and one ant there. So uh, it wouldn't be possible for the bird in this example to change its habit because there's already a bird eating the big beetle and the ant is eating the little beetle to such a level that the small bird can't find enough. So that's the basic argument that we have for why birds can't switch. But there's a second point to this question, which is a really good one, which is why don't the birds start eating ants? And um, uh, the reason we feel that that's not happening is because birds do eat ants, but they're woodpeckers. Woodpeckers are not songbirds, but at the base of the mountain in Bengal, you've got 14 species of woodpecker non passerine birds that were around long before songbirds evolved. The songbirds only got to uh, the Himalaya about 35 million years ago, whereas woodpeckers were there at least 65 million years ago. So the woodpeckers have, have basically got the ant niche to themselves and they're keeping the songbirds out of it. Uh, two, three students, they have got a question and I'm combining uh, uh, their question together. They are asking that uh, the Himalayan region, including the Tibetan Plateau, has shown consi consistent warming trends during the last 100 years. So is there any documented uh, effect of this uh, climate change on the biodiversity of the eastern Himalayas? That's a, great, that's a great question, and the answer is no. Not only do we not have... Um, uh, no documentation. There's one study uh, from Sikkim that compared uh, records of Joseph Hooker on plants to present day distributions of plants and showed there'd been movement up slope of the plants. It's a little difficult though because Hooker's records are somewhat difficult to uh, disentangle. But the last 20 or 30 years where of course uh, we've seen uh, most climate change We've got no documentation at all from the East Himalayas of what that's doing to biodiversity. Not only that, we've got very little documentation of what the climate's really doing. We're relying on satellite documentation. Uh, there's a crying need for more climate stations and more biodiversity research in the East Himalaya. We've got some data from the West Himalaya though. Uh, we work in the West too, and other people have worked in the West. And we are seeing retraction of low elevational range limits in the West Himalaya. That retraction correlates with a warming in the West Himalaya. The West Himalaya has clearly warmed more than East actually, it's already warmed by two degrees, it's at the threshold. What we're not sure about, and I'm still not sure about, is whether these retractions of range have got anything to do with the breeding season and the change in the uh, temperature in the West Himalaya, or if they've got more to do with what's happening in the winter in peninsular India, where we're seeing not only temperature changes, but land use changes. So I think populations are being limited as much by climate in the non-breeding season as they are in the breeding season, at least for birds. Uh, maybe it, it should be the last question. Uh, that uh, the hotspots of biodiversity in the world, do they have a higher rate of speciation? That is a really good question. And uh, that is uh, a huge debate. A lot of our work is on does speciation rate uh, affect uh, biodiversity hotspots? Many of you may have heard of the museum versus cradle argument. Are biodiversity hotspots places where species have not gone extinct or where species have been rapidly produced? 
all the evidence seems to point more towards a museum where speciation rates have not necessarily been high, but these are places where you haven't had extinction. So for example, the East Himalaya remained more or less the same climate through the last glaciations, the last two million years, whereas the West Himalaya dried out and must have lost a lot of species. So thank you, Dr. Price. Uh, so over to Dr. Parati for the final words. Can I, just before that, can I just say one thing, which is uh, if anyone would like to get in touch with me, uh, you can just Google me at the University of Chicago and send me an email. Uh, there's two things. One is I'm happy to continue. As you can see, I love talking about biodiversity in the Himalayas. So I'm happy to answer other questions. But I'm also very keen on helping people who want to work in the East Himalaya. We need much more research going on there. Uh, it's not easy, but, you know, um, logistically and, you know, anything that you'd like to help, I can point you in directions to get people working there. So don't hesitate to get in touch with me. Thank you, Trevor. That was magnificent talk and uh, supplemented with nice empirical data. And you provided a good overview of what is happening in Eastern Himalaya. And I'm very happy that students uh, came up with questions on speciation and other aspects. So thank you so much. Okay. My pleasure. I'll go and get some breakfast. Bye. <laughs> okay, thank you. Cheers.